Hey guys, Tess here from www.itsyourtherapy.com and we are here today to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, also referred to as PTSD. According to the Diagnostical Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, the DSM-5, there are the requirement to be labeled with or have this PTSD disorder or PTSD is having one or four of the following. So the first is actually exposure to a traumatic event. So this is an event that creates trauma to the neural network. They used to call it shell shock because your brain, your neural network literally freezes or is shocked and it doesn't know how to process this information. It doesn't know where to go. So it stays stuck. And throughout life, you're neural network is trying to make sense of this happening and a lot of times you will have these symptoms as a result and we'll go into that so um, the second thing is witnessing it in person so you experience the traumatic event like you know you experienced the abuse or you were the policeman um, who uh, was shot or um, you witnessed someone being shot and you were there in the actual um, e event. And the third is learning that someone close to you, a close family member, uh, someone that you really feel is um, maybe you have some uh, secure attachment to or an attachment to and you learn about them getting in a traumatic event. Um, and that becomes traumatizing to you because of how close you are with that individual and the kind of attachment you guys have. And or the fourth is experiencing repeated or extreme exposure. The next set of criteria, criteria B, are a set of intrusive, intrusive symptoms. So this could be reoccurrent or involuntary intrusive distressing memories of the event that just come into your thought processes and you're like, why is this memory here? I don't understand. Um, and it's disturbing. So it's not something that, like a memory, like, oh, I need to go take out the trash today. It's not like that. It comes at unwanted times and it's unwanted and often disturbing. So that is um, one of the five that are required for this particular um, criterion B. And the next one is reoccurring distressing dreams. So in therapy, we call this night terrors, and often the night terrors can be waking up in the sweats, and you don't even remember the dream. So you don't know if it was a nightmare or not. You just know, hey, I'm waking up and I'm just sweating everywhere. Like my body's just so profusely sweating, or I'm in a bag of wet sweat, um, just waking up, and I don't know why. And sometimes it happens in the morning, and sometimes it happens in the nighttime. It can happen multiple times at night. Um, depending on the complexity of the trauma and how your brain is processing or your neural network is trying to again find where to categorize this how to compartmentalize these memories that you haven't consciously made sense of because when they did happen it didn't make conscious sense it was out of your logical schema to where it wasn't possible to create any logical sense of it. So that is the second one. And the third one is dissociative reactions. So these are often considered flashbacks. So it's like you get a picture of the memory and you're thinking about that um, time where you saw those remains or you're, you saw someone's head blown off or you got shot in the arm or your dad left in the middle of the night or whatever the distressing memory is that comes up for you um, where you felt like your life was threatened that would be a dissociative reaction um, because you didn't want to think about it and it wasn't just a thought it was an actual visual memory of the actual event and what occurs after that is hyper arousal so you get the same sensations that you did when you were five when the memory happened um, and you found out the information or you witnessed that event or it happened to you, you now feel that same kind of pain um, within yourself and your body reacts the same. So um, a lot of people will act out, a lot of times in anger, um, act out in general, try to numb themselves to substances, 
um, attached to people aggressively, you know, multiple ways that we behave as a result of these symptoms, but that is considered dissociative reaction or a flashback. Okay, the next thing, number four, is intense or prolonged psychological distress at the exposure of internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an, an aspect of a traumatic event. So this is um, any time that you are exposed to something similar or your brain is like, oh, that kind of reminds me of that situation, then, or the traumatic event, then you, be, you experience that distress, which I talked about, that manifests itself physically. Um, you have the feelings and the sensations that occur as a result of that flashback or it could be just something in the environment that reminds you of it and then you just start having this like anxiety you're like I don't even know where this is coming from and it's all because your body is so smart that it recognizes these um, similarities and picks up on it and reacts in a way that would normally be to help you to survive so we have to consciously work through these things like I'm okay and self-talk and you know there's different therapies for that such as EMDR which I'm trained in um, and have found to be extremely helpful um, there's CBT there's other modalities specific that will help this and if you want to know more about those like specific treatments and modalities that can help trauma um, go ahead and comment below or ask me email me and I will be happy to let you in on those and the fifth thing is marked physiological reactions to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the traumatic event, which I just spoke about. So it's either distress that you feel internally and emotionally. Criterion C is titled persistent avoidance of stimuli. Whether that's internal or external, it can be both the internal distressing memories, thoughts, and feelings, or external reminders of people, places, conversations, activities, objects, situations that arouse the distressing memories, thoughts, or feelings, and the feelings including the sensation. The criterion D is negative alterations in con cognitions or mood. So um, obviously cognitions are your thoughts and your mood um, is affects you know your attitude and just your outlook on life. And what happens after these kinds of events, we tend to have a skewed worldview. And it's in order to make sense of it or the, the because we haven't made up sense of it, we often become irritable or angry or have negative beliefs that just overall make us more negative overall. We just see the world through a less positive picture um, because of these traumatic events. Okay, so you need two of seven in order to meet the criteria for this particular section of the diagnostic criteria. The first one is inability to remember an important aspect of the traumatic event. So you're asked if you can remember different parts of it and you feel like there's so many details but you just cannot bring up the memory and a lot of it's because you're just not ready to handle that pain and your brain knows that, your body knows that so it's not going to bring that back up or it just seems so distant and you've suppressed those memories for so long that even if you try it just it's so far away there's there's layers and there's so many other memories that are just compiled on those that it's like somewhere deep within your subconscious that it's difficult to bring up those memories and then there's also people that have very vivid memories they can remember exactly what happened um and up the opportunity presents itself to explain those when you're at the in therapy because it offers that safe space so that would be amazing if you could do that you could heal from this there is hope okay the second thing is persistence and exaggerated negative beliefs or expectations about oneself others or the world so this is a negative outlook that i was explaining before um it can implode like you can have that negative outlook on yourself you can have it on other people uh, or just about the world in general and we often want to have something to blame so we'll blame ourselves I'm bad I'm guilty it's my fault but nobody can be trusted we use all-or-nothing statements like that very black and white um, the world's a completely dangerous place um, nobody's safe I'm not safe I'm gonna die 
is you feel like your whole nervous system is completely ruined or you're ruined. There's lots of different negative detailed uh, thoughts and cognitions that we have, but those are just some of them. And the third is persistent distorted cognitions about the cause or consequences of the traumatic event. So we might make up our stories about this traumatic event, why it occurred. For example, a drunk driver ran over the, your daughter and you're a mom or your dad and you make up this story about the drunk driver that she deliberately did this and you know she's out to get your family and you're paranoid or she was just a dumb broad that you know wasn't paying attention or she's out to get children or whatever the story is just not adding up but it's a way that your brain wants to rationalize the situation so you have somewhere to put your anger your hurt your pain onto um so it makes sense for your brain but it ends up hurting us in the end so finding an, an outlet an avenue to really deal with those emotions is extremely um, prevalent to the healing process and the fourth one is persistent negative emotional state so constantly having anxiety constantly being irritable constantly being agitated having anger feeling guilty all the time for everything you're taking on guilt and responsibility for things that you are not guilty really for and it's not your responsibility you have shame not just guilt over something you know you did wrong but like shameful feelings you know with the shoulds that i'm not measuring up or i'm not good enough type of thoughts fearing everything whether it be conversing with people or doing fun things or going out of the house fear of rejection every fear becomes exaggerated uh even horror uh i've experience a lot of clients that say terrified. If you use the word terrified, that is a kind of a red flag for me as a therapist that you might have suffered trauma in your past. Because terrified, um, you to experience something terrified and use that word so nonchalantly, um, typically is, is not some, someone that hasn't experienced trauma probably wouldn't use terrified. They'd be like, I'm scared or I'm afraid, you know? not terrifying so really um, deep words like that are red flags for me um, to dig a little deeper the fifth thing is markedly diminished interest or participation in significant activities so this is very similar to depression and hedonia feeling like you know you're not as interested in things as you were before just not motivated and or just it could be the avoidance factor too so there could be multiple reasons why but you don't do the things that you used to enjoy and you don't find things interesting as you did once before this traumatic event. And the sixth thing is feelings of detachment or estrangement from others. So just not being able to connect um, and really feel that sense of warmth from being with the, another person in proximity or in conversation um, or in relationship. The last but not least is number seven, persistent inability to experience positive emotions. So that irritability that I was talking about earlier, having the negative emotions is goes right alongside with this, not being able to experience positive emotions, sense of satisfaction in life, happiness, loving feelings, all of those. Okay. E is marked alterations in arousal and reactivity associated with the event. So um, kind of like I was talking about before, this is the explanation of the arousal, so specific arousal patterns that happen, and it's two of six of these. The first one is irritable behavior or out angry outbursts. So maybe you have an angry outburst and it seems like n nobody provoked you and or maybe it wasn't a very big provocation and you reacted so strongly that it probably surprised people around you. It's usually expressed verbally, but a lot of times physically. Um, so being physically aggressive, males probably more the physically physical aggression is expressed. Um, females, due to culture, more verbally, um, but a lot of times it doesn't matter about the gender. It's either or, um, but that is just culturally what has been observed. And then the second thing is reckless or self-destructive behavior. So crashing cars, substance abuse, sexual behavior, promiscuity, spending tons of money, just kind of not caring about yourself and just taking chances and, and risks that could put your life in danger. The third one is hypervigilance, so just kind of, you know, looking over your shoulder, 
like, you know, kind of thinking every, some, somebody might be behind you or like you have to, and it may be subconscious too. Um, for example, going to a restaurant and you have to be facing the door or you're in a room full of people and you have to be next to the door, having a way to escape. Um, just kind of like always hyper vigilant, like someone comes behind you and it's a very uncomfortable feeling. It's not, you don't feel safe unless you're like hyper aroused, like just hyper vigilant, very vigilant about what's going on around you at all times. And that is so consistent and persistent. Um, it's not like somebody's in, you know, a dark alley and so they're looking around themselves to protect themselves. It's just all the time, even in places where most people would find safe, you know, at work, home whatever. Uh, and the fourth thing is exaggerated startle response. So that could be that aggression earlier that I mentioned, but it's more of the jumpiness. You know, somebody does come up behind you and you jump or you feel startled very easily, just kind of jumpy. The fifth thing is problems with concentration. Because of the anxiety, and actually the latest research has showed that if you had anxiety when you were young as a child, then you actually have a enlarged amygdala and a smaller um, executive functioning, specifically the anterior cingulate cortex. The sixth thing is sleep disturbance. So difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, having restless sleep that can have to do with night terrors. Or it can just be that restless leg syndrome or just difficulty overall with sleep. And that can be due to fear too, racing thoughts before you go to bed. Just your brain, your neural network trying to make that sense of things affects all the other organs in your body and how you respond to the environment. For F is the next one. Duration of the disturbance. So is more than one month. So after the traumatic event, then you have these symptoms, you meet the criteria for more than one month. The disturbance causes clinically significant distress or impairment. So because of these symptoms, you now are struggling socially or occupationally or just daily functioning. You do life, your ability to do life. And H, the last one, is the disturbance is not attributable to the physiological effects of the substance. Um, or another medical condition. So basically that has to do with all the disorders. If a medical th condition or substance can ha has influenced the uh, symptoms, then you can't be diagnosed. Okay. Um, the specifiers for this are with dissociative symptoms, and there are two, depersonalization and derealization. So depersonalization is when you feel detached from your own body, kind of like you're hovering above your body and you're watching yourself from a distance do life. Um, derealization is the unreality of surroundings. So it feels like you, like your body might be intact, but you're not really connecting with the environment. You know, so we use different like grounding skills to connect yourself again to the environment. What do I think? What do I hear? What do I, what can I touch? What can I smell? What can I taste? Um, kind of grounding different various techniques to bring you back to the present and start connecting to your environment. So the main thing is here, if you get nothing out of this, is that we need to connect with each other. We need to connect with our environment. Um, and if we're unable to do that, then we need to get the help that we need in order to do that, because that is going to be the best option for us to optimize our wellness, our health, and ultimately our sense of satisfaction and happiness in life. Till next time.